Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to you this chilly Monday lunchtime, chilly in London at any rate. My name is Giles Whittell. I'm an editor at Tortoise, and I'm delighted to be hosting this conversation in partnership with the uh, One Campaign. Um, our exam question is how do you build a fairer wor world in an era of perma crisis? I definitely don't know the answer, but on Saturday afternoon, I was driving back into London from a football match with my, a school football match with my 14 year old son and was simultaneously preoccupied with all the things that ail the world and anxious to engage my 14 year old son in conversation. And I came up with what seemed like a crazy question, which is uh, in order to deal with the challenge posed to democracies by tyrannies, how about tasking the CIA and MI6 with recruiting a whole new generation of spies through video games? And that at least served the purpose of engaging my 14 year old son. Um, I think that it should probably stay in the realm of of young adult fiction, but I mention it for a reason that might become clear in a second, because we're in a strange place with an awful lot that needs fixing uh, that's going wrong at the moment. Um, daily at Tortoise, I'm preoccupied with uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, some of our guests have written extensively about inflationary pressures, the energy price shock, the food price shock, all feeding on each other. Uh, a whole system of cryptocurrencies collapsing around us. And I think behind all of them, um, a crisis for democracies, for democracy as an as a organizing principle and mode of governance, uh, and even more fundamental perhaps, the climate crisis brought on by the way we've chosen to power our economies. Um, and, and most of these like COVID, and like the financial crash before that had turned out ultimately to hit the most vulnerable people hardest. And, and there's a feeling uh, discussed in the last one of these conversations, as well as this one, that um, many of the bodies, the world bodies set up to deal with world problems on things of the COP series of conferences, G20, G7, the World Bank, the IMF, NATO, all the donor conferences that take place monthly practically now to keep Ukraine supplied with money and weapons aren't actually up to the task. So uh, what is to be done? We have an hour and we want to focus as far as possible on concrete, practical proposals, solutions that might actually um, reform these bodies or, or without actually rebuilding them, make the world a fairer place, a more resilient place. So what are the institutions that we want to focus on? Um, do we need new ones? Can we get away with just reforming them? What works in financial and foreign policy? Um, a senior former British politician sent a message to Tortoise not long ago, uh, it, indicating that one of his ideas that he'd like to float was doubling the UK intelligence budget, which is why uh, perhaps I'm not mad after all, or perhaps he is. But in any case, we've got some guest speakers who are definitely not mad, who know a lot more about this than, um, uh, than I do. Uh, I warned them all just before we started that I was going to ask them before we finished for some silver bullets, however heretical that might be to nuance debate. Uh, but we'll start more generally, I hope, and I'll introduce you, uh, our guests, as, as we come to you. I want to start with Martin Wolf, um, the Chief Economics Editor of the Financial Times. We're very uh, uh, lucky to have you with us, Martin. Um, I should imagine you're on deadline. Um, but you've recently written that um, in an age of what you call polycrisis, um, siloed thinking is fundamentally inappropriate. So I wanted to ask a general question, uh, what you think the implications of that are for the institutions, the world bodies that we entrust with finding solutions to the kinds of problems that I've uh, touched on. What, what would be your 
headline reforms? Well, I'm going to, I think, disappoint you a little because I think that at this stage, what I want to do is to set out exactly why it's so difficult and how radical, in all probability, the institutional reforms will be that will be needed um, to deal with it. Um, so the, the the core problem, I think, is uh, clear that the the dominant institutional systems of our world um, were essentially post Second World War constructs. Um, there have been a, some modifications and developments over that time. And they were created essentially um, uh, um, by the US, to a lesser degree, the UK as victors. And they covered a large part of the world, but pretty soon it became obvious they didn't cover the Soviet empire. They didn't cover most of the, de uh, the developing world after it became independent. And these systems haven't been changed and they're clearly ineffective on multiple levels. Uh, I can't go into that in detail, but that's reasonably obvious. That's the first point I wanted to make. The second point is, why is this era so difficult? Well, the core problem is um, we have systems crises which interlock globally, come to those in a moment, interconnect globally. And we have, by design, essentially, uh, uh, an international order which is rooted in an institution, and our, the democracy you referred to is clearly rooted in an institution, which is intended not to think globally, namely the, the state, the nation state, which has been, which is the, the dominant form of political and social uh, organization. Um, and uh, that is the fundamental problem, it seems to me. We have a global economic in, in system, a global politically interactive system, and sovereignty and power essentially vested in nation states in some more than others. And third, and I think essentially finally, let me go through very briefly what I think are the essential critical uh, crises, the crises that we're dealing with. Right. First, we are at the end we're at the end. We are we have experienced three massive global shocks over the last 15 years. Um, it's a pretty rapid rate. The uh, financial crisis still in many ways unsolved, uh, a pandemic uh, and a war which contributed a, or exacerbated a massive energy crisis and an inflation uh, shock. We have a fundamental shift in global power relations with the emergence of a new superpower and a dramatic superpower conflict, which is ending the unipolar moment and making global governments even more difficult than before. We have the beginning of a fundamental transformation of what is called the neoliberal order or the, or the globalization order with no real idea of what economic system will replace it. We have an undergo an ongoing fundamental environmental crises which are generated essentially by the transformation of the world economy over the last two centuries, which is still ongoing. Um, and that's what I think I would call the poly crisis. Uh, and the, um, these have all stressed, very powerfully stressed, and I think made essentially dysfunctional what was already a borderline dysfunctional international system, as I said, essentially created after the Second World War and rooted in the nation state, which remains a profoundly selfish and anarchic system. That's a, a wonderful tour d'horizon, Martin. I, just before we go on to Professor Avinash Perso, I want to come back to you on this idea of the sort of primacy of the nation state. In a sense, the United Nations system and um, uh, smaller but nonetheless supranational ones like the EU recognized, didn't they, um, what you the problems inherent with the nation state as an organizing principle and invited nation states to surrender a bit of sovereignty in, in return for vital cooperation. Why haven't they why haven't they worked or have they? Well, I think they're better than nothing. The EU has worked. Um, uh, in my first book on globalization, I had a whole chapter on whether the EU could be the model for the world. And I sort of put it forward as a 
possible direction, but not very optimistically. But I think there are very special conditions in which the EU has worked, and it has only worked to a certain extent. But it is a clearly, I think, the most successful example of regional cooperation. The UN was designed almost to fail in the sense that its core institution, I mean, I think the UN does a lot of very good stuff and the UN institutions do a lot of good stuff. But from the point of view dealing with the sorts of challenges we're talking about here, much of the burden falls on two ideas. Uh, uh, the Security Council, which has been blocked, uh, um, essentially blocked by veto for much of its history and is now totally outmoded what the hell are britain and france doing there uh, and not being adjusted so it's totally ossified or on the principle which also actually is the world trade organization principle of near unanimity that is to say ultimately we agree to do things together um uh, but we can't really be forced to and i think the progress of climate negotiations reveals the huge problem with essentially um uh boundless national sovereignty um in that no country has been forced to accept anything it didn't want to accept and what they've chosen to accept is not enough in every single case and the international responsibility mutual responsibility they they've actually been willing to bear and pay for particularly the richer countries has been next to zero so it, it looks very nice everybody meets and talks but they don't do much. And the G20, which was a real sort of effort 23 years ago, and then with the summits back in 2007 and eight, to move towards a more effective system of global governance, I think has been a failure now for a very long time. And the split between the US and China make it pretty well completely dysfunctional. So I would argue that the system continues to rest ultimately on the sovereign nation state, and particularly, of course, the superpowers, uh, uh, but also actually the difficulty of coercing, and I can see perfectly well why, pretty well every other state. And that makes it very difficult, immensely difficult to agree effective systems to deal with global crises. And I would just point out, you know, we had a huge global climate uh, conference in Kyoto 30 years ago. Most governments sort of officially recognized there was a problem well, if you want to look at what has happened to deal with it, I suggest you look at the history of global emissions since then. Thanks, Martin. Um, not least for a pretty elegant elegant segue to Professor Persaud, Special Envoy to Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. Um, you, Avinash, are a lead author of the Bridgetown uh, the Bridgetown, what is it again? Initiative. Initiative. Bridgetown Initiative. Forgive, yeah. forgive me. Which, um, um, out of the context that Martin has just described, has come up with a, a highly specific, um, uh, much admired uh, solution to uh, the climate crisis as we see it right now and as it's being experienced by small countries like uh, Barbados. Can, can you tell us? what it is and uh, whether you think the support that it's attracted in the last two COPs will actually uh, develop into concrete policy initiatives on the kind of very ambitious scale that the initiative hopes for. Great, well, thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity. Um, and, and let me uh, rise to uh, to Martin's challenge, well-articulated challenge that we face. Um, and uh, as you said, we've come up with something called the Bridgetown Initiative, uh, which the core part are, are sort of five achievable things over the next 18 months, five achievable things that have been curated in that if we do these five, they're individually achievable, but collectively they help to redraw the global financial system and make a real difference. Um, and, and let me begin by saying that they start off really with, with three from three places. Um, firstly, as you say, I was, I was born in Barbados. I, I, uh, uh, I'm Prime Minister Motley's Special Envoy on Climate Finance. I work with a number of, uh, of climate vulnerable countries, so not just small, small countries. Uh, the the uh, UN IPCC defines 40% of the world 
that's climate vulnerable. That's about 3.3 billion people. That's not just uh, small island states, but a uh, huge swathes of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, the first point is that as a small island developing state, we are drowning and burning up. And so that focuses the mind. So we observe what's going on and we're not writing an academic paper. Uh, we're thinking what can actually practically make a difference in a meaningful short space of time. Uh, there's no point you know, hankering after something that will never be achieved in the next decade because we don't have a decade. And, and the second thing uh, that has focused, uh, has, has helped develop these ideas is attending the pre-COP meetings. Um, uh, and the, in the pre-COP meetings, so this is before the big meeting, they get together a smaller set of countries uh, and start debating one or two issues. And it was very obvious for being in the room uh, of why COP fails, but also why what the opportunities are for a pathway of progress. And, and, and seeing that and hearing that, uh, so it's partly how we got loss and damage uh, approved at the last COP. So it was very clear that when we define loss and damage from climate events as some kind of all historic responsibilities, that was too open-ended a liability. But if we defined uh, this specific thing that we're trying to deal with as reconstruction after a climatic event, there was willingness within Europe and others uh, to entertain that. Uh, I could talk a little bit more about how that deal was achieved, but it was obvious to us that whilst of what was a problem and what were potential solutions. And, and the third thing, and, and this picks up a little bit on, on Francis's work on the, uh, the people's QE, you know, we are, people often say that uh, the problem is not enough money. Well, we spent $24 trillion buying government bonds over the past 12 years. If we had said we will only buy government bonds that finance climate mitigation projects, we would be halfway to ending climate change today. The total cost of ending climate change is around $50 trillion. We spent $24 trillion buying government bonds for consumption. If we bought government bonds for investment in climate uh, mitigation, we'd be halfway to uh, solving climate change. So the issue isn't actually about money. It's about direction. It's about aim. So what are the five ideas? Uh, the first idea is the multilateral development banks are critical to, to what's going on. They are currently extremely underpowered. The total amount of lending every year by the MDBs, World Bank, ITB, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, is about $80 billion. Now, you know, these numbers seem big, but that is about 12% of all the financing required to mitigate the climate in, uh, in the world. And the MDBs, of course, have far more, a far wider agenda than just climate. They've got 16 other sustainable development goals to deal with. Uh, so that, that's just 12%. Well, the G20 Working Party has shown that they could lend about $1 trillion more, three times the annual lending today for the next 10 years, if they do just three things, raise their risk appetite, you know, the minute any banker becomes a development banker or anyone becomes a development banker, they become super cautious. Uh, you know, they, they go through some kind of conversion and they love to say no. Saying no gives them great power. They love to say no. They need to change their risk appetite. Secondly, they need to include donor guarantees in their framework for thinking how much they can lend. So governments say, if the World Bank ever goes bust, I'll put you in some capital. Given the World Bank is a AAA rated institution, the likelihood of that of them going bust is pretty low, uh, but they don't include that commitment in, in how much they can lend. And thirdly, something the G20 Working Party doesn't talk a lot about, but we believe they should use some of the re existing special drawing rights that they've been given by the IMF. They, the multilateral development bank should be allowed to hold these at the moment only countries can hold them. They should be able to hold them uh, and use that to help them in, in their lending uh, capacity. So we reckon they can lend $1 trillion more, three times more per year than they do. And the priorities of that should be the sustainable development goals and climate adaptation, not climate mitigation, not climate loss and damage. And we'll come to, 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 to those different things, but Adaptation, 
sorry, you say the sustainable development goals. Um, so all 17 of them, not just climate change mitigation. Of course, the, the world has many serious yeah. problems. There are people out there who, who live on one dollar a day, who don't have access to clean water, who uh, are homeless. So we can't just focus on climate. Development and climate are, are interrelated, but they're also separate issues. So we say climate adaptation. The reason why we say climate adaptation is because you know, multilateral development bank lending can be expanded, but it will still be limited. And so it should be focused on what the public sector, only the public sector can really spend money on. And flood defenses, uh, uh, sea level defenses uh, are something you cannot get the private sector to do because there's no revenue streams for them. So we'll get the private sector involved in climate mitigation with some help from the public, se public sector, but let the multilateral development bank focus on, on adaptation. Let me try and whiz through the others because okay. I don't want to take up too much yep. time. Um, so the other thing we need to do is, is expand concessional lending. So there is this uh, idea that concessional lending should only go to the very poorest countries. The, and that made sense in the 1960s. But because of inequalities widening, 70% of the world's poor, 7-0, live in countries not eligible for concessional uh, borrowing from the multilateral development banks. So Bridgetown 2 says, look, we've got to widen concessional lending. Now we know concessional lending is scarce, so let's be limited. Let's only lend to climate vulnerable countries only when they're investing in climate resilient. So that keeps it limited, but makes a huge difference. Every $1 I spend today, I save $7 in the future from a disaster. It makes perfect economic investment sense for them to be forcing more investment uh, and concessional terms to climate vulnerable countries so they can accelerate their investment. Third thing, the, the world is gonna have more debt. It already has a lot of debt. We already have a debt crisis. We're gonna get even more debt when we start dealing with, with climate investments and the SDGs. We're saying we need to have a, a reformed debt architecture. We have, we're, we're, we in Barbados are the world's largest issuer of something called natural disaster clauses. They're not an insurance contract. When a natural disaster hits for two years, we can suspend our interest payments, our principal payments. They're then taken and tacked on to the end of, of the bond the end of the, the financing instrument. So from a lender's point of view, they have the same value that they had before. They just have this period where the borrower gets liquidity in a way that they don't otherwise get. If every country had these, uh, developing countries would have got $1 trillion of liquidity, $1 trillion of liquidity during COVID. That is twice the amount they were able to spend on dealing with COVID. And that is about 100 times more than this so-called debt service suspension initiative that the G20 came up with. So we believe natural disaster causes and every debt instrument um, are completely unsexy and hugely powerful. It would transform the debt architecture. So uh, that's, number, that's number three. Uh, let me do the fourth one and I'll, I'll skip out the fifth so we can come back to it. But they, okay. the fourth one is, okay, we need... And the first three I've just said to you, the, these are things for existing institutions. These are things that does not require anyone to write a check. And what we say to our developing country friends who are clamoring for massive checks to be written is that, well, these rich countries, they're not even sending checks to their own people. You know, there's huge amount of social issues in their own countries. Why do you think they're gonna write big checks? Uh, for, for foreigners. They're only writing big checks when they're deporting foreigners. They're not writing big checks to help foreigners. So, so we say, look, there's a huge amount you can do without big checks. You can triple MDB lending. You can change the, the debt architecture, but there's one, but we need a, a, a new architecture and we call it the Global Climate Mitigation Trust. We believe there needs to be $500 billion of unused SDRs uh, these are held by countries that actually have SDRs that don't need them because they actually issue their own international reserve currency. So why would they use uh, someone else's? Um, uh, put in a trust, uh, which uh, is then allocated, um, lent uh, as an equity investment into um, projects in developing countries to mitigate the climate. And we think this equity investment will galvanize two to three trillion dollars of private sector savings 
into projects uh, to, to mitigate the climate. And that's what we need to drive the private sector. My final point would be, you know, people sit there and they, they, they require developing countries to, act, to be more ambitious, more ambitious. COP is a weird thing. You're supposed to go there and make unfunded commitments. We don't make unfunded commitments. We don't let government officials make unfunded commitments in almost any other sphere of the world. How can a, a India uh, make a commitment that it can't fund? So we need to be able to provide the funding as well as pushing the, the ambition. Uh, and this, this is a way of providing the funding for financing. If you're in a developing country, your average cost of capital for a, a renewable energy project is 14 uh, to set to 20%. There's almost no renewable energy project that will make money at that cost of capital. In the rich countries, the cost of capital is around 2 to 4%. So that's why they don't understand why developing countries aren't doing it, because for them, finance is not the problem. But finance is a huge problem, and our global climate mitigation costs will help to solve it. That's the number four. I, I will I will break here because let other people have a chat, and we could talk about how you fund loss and damage, which is number five later. Great, thank you very much. I'm sure there's a lot to uh, come back to there. Uh, Francis, just before we come to you, Jennifer Allerton has been very busy in the chat and um, a, a little earlier um, made the point that it's not just, it may not just be uh, nation states and supranational organizations that are failing, but I think you wanted to point the finger elsewhere. Jennifer, are you with us? Did you want to uh, expand on that? Probably unfair of me um, uh, on, on George. Are you there? That's okay. Yeah, I'm here. Hi. Um, uh, I'm very bad at reading the chat at the same time as listening, but am I right that you wanted to put, point the finger elsewhere? Um, uh, which I can't remember which thing you're talking about. I think at, at, at um, self interested multinational corporations. Right. Yeah. Um... Uh, yeah, so, so I, well, what I was saying at that point basically was there are um, problems with every kind of system that we have or way we could organise it. It's not the, um, you know, the idea of nation states and the rise of um, national populism and nationalism has its um, obvious kind of selfishness and in, in exclusion and um that kind of isolatory mm -hmm. look on things but then you have at the other end of it globalism and that's exploited by the large multinational corporations um and they're both they're sort of treated like opposites but they are both kind of working in the same way like whatever system we have it's not like a problem with any of them in principle the eu the World Trade Organization, the national governments, but it's the fact that people will, um, they get a bit of power and they'll exploit it for their own selfish interests um, and use it to their own advantage. And it, it's the the culture and the, the way we look at things um, of like competition and always trying to get to the top rather than working together towards things. Okay, if thank you very much. I don't know. No, no, that's very helpful. And, and bearing that in mind, Francis, um, you delightfully uh, refer to yourself on Twitter as a woke left finance shill. <laughs> um, what is your uh, response to Jennifer's point there? And, and um, Avinash earlier mentioned your work on, on people's QE. Mm -hmm. um, talk about that a little bit. And uh, Tell us what fundamental reform of international financial bodies uh, like the IMF and the World Bank would look like if you had your way. Yeah, um, I mean, where I kind of start on this, I mean, I could look back a lot further and see the roots of a lot of what's going on at the moment um, in the, the neoliberal experiment really of the 1980s and when that's played out. But perhaps the more immediate cause of where we are now is actually the great financial crisis. Um, and the way in which we responded to that, which was pretty much to try and shore up the existing system um, in all its panoply. Interesting, I don't know how many people know this, but the prior, just prior to the financial crisis, the IMF had been considering dissolving itself because nobody needed it anymore. 
Then we had the financial crisis and suddenly lots of uh, countries needed it. And the paradigm that it used was the one that it has always used. And then in the Eurozone crisis, the EU kind of adopted the same paradigm. We did never really revisited whether this is how we ought to be designing um, our international financial and economic institutions now, or whether mm -hmm. um, we should be rethinking it. And um, where I came in was I was looking at QE, which I am no fan of, as anybody who's read my work over a long period of time now will know, um, that I think that although it was a very good tool um, to prevent the disastrous downward spiral that could have resulted in another 1930s type depression um, in the very early stages after the financial crisis, it was then massively overused um, after that to try and kickstart growth, which it's not actually very good at doing. And perhaps even, even more poisonously used to cover for um, premature and really very regressive fiscal consolidation by governments, which it can't really do because its own effects are quite re quite regressive. So when I looked at this, I concluded that um, it was the wrong tool being used the wrong way. Its effects, if effective at all during that time, were very weak. And it unfortunately allowed some governments to get away with really quite brutal treatment of rather vulnerable people. And perhaps more importantly, and I can speak about, my, about the UK particularly here, but it applies to other countries too, that we actually, partially dismantled or degraded or even destroyed the national and some of the supranational as well institutions that actually made us resilient to shocks. So um, in the UK, for example, the degradation of public services, and I don't, I'm um, the headline one is the NHS, but people don't talk enough, for example, about the degradation of um, justice, for example, mm -hmm. um, which is hugely important. Um, and, and, then, and it's a really core public service that every nation state needs. And here we were underfunding it massively for years using QE as a cover. So I felt, and I still feel, that um, really the government shouldn't be able to get away with that. Um, and that QE should be more constructively used um, actually to um, help um, pull economies out of recession and you do that by reflating the, the private sector directly so you give money to people and you give money to businesses and you stop worrying about the solvency of the central bank because that ultimately is the government's responsibility which martin mentioned earlier um, you use qe um, in the way that it was used immediately after the financial crisis and also in the early days of the pandemic as well to mm. prevent a disastrous collapse of asset prices which can cause a depression but otherwise it's fiscal that carries everything and we need to be working to be bringing monetary policy and particularly things like you into their proper function which is to support the endeavors of, gov of governments and super super governmental organizations to do what is necessary to address the multiple crises that we're uh, we're dealing with and in my view particularly the long-term ones that we are facing which i mentioned at the end of my book um obviously um climate change the pivot away from fossil fuels which is i don't think we kind of understood the ramifications of that at all but it's really the death of economics as we know it um the pivot from a, 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 a paradigm in which we expect there to be a constant influx of young people into the workforce who will through their efforts produce um, the the real incomes we need to support those who can no longer produce we've got instead of which we we're moving to a, to a phase where there's an awful lot of people who expect to be unproductive and a diminishing number of people who expect to be productive and we haven't quite worked out how we're going to manage that either um, and also the fact that we've never really accounted for the environmental degradation that comes from the way in which we do economics the way in which we've done growth in the past somebody's been talking about this in the chat actually i think it's a really important point that we need to be accounting things for things properly. And I reckon if we did, we'd probably find that an awful lot of the growth of the last 200 years has had a very high cost and we need to be accounting for things properly. And perhaps actually looking rather than at growth, at things that produce better outcomes for people and for the planet um, and maybe move away from this obsession with growth that we 
um, seem to have at the moment. So what I'd like to see in terms of transformation of the financial system, I think we should be looking more at outcomes for people um, mm -hmm. and the way in which um, businesses support them and the way in which people collectively are responsible for the stewardship of the planet. And we should be re rebuilding our financial institutions to use money in the service of that, rather than allowing money or the lack of it to dominate our political decisions in such a way that we can preside over the degradation of essential um, infrastructure and essential services, um, lose the resilience, then be unable to cope with shocks, and importantly, not have the resources to deal with long term challenges. I haven't given any great specifics, sir, and I'd be very interested to hear other people's ideas on this. And we'll come back to you uh, to, to ask uh, for some of them before the end. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard, among other things, uh, from Francis and from Avinash, the case for what amounts to substantial transfers of Welsh of wealth uh, within nation states and, and uh, more broadly transnationally. Gail, I've, I'm deliberately, I'm coming to you after we've heard uh, the other three, um, because you have a direct experience uh, working with and in the UN system and also in the US government, and not to mention the one campaign. Um, and it strikes me that the world bodies that you're familiar with have found, uh, not least for reasons like um, the, the paralysis of UN Security Council and the need for near unanimity in, in UN bodies, that when it comes to acting on big asks like big transfers of wealth, these bodies don't have the, the authority without, admiring the problem too much. And, and looking back on the past few years, including COVID, what are your calls to action in terms of reform of international bodies for the next year? Um, happy to answer that. I do at the risk of admiring the problem to the point that we all just want to turn off our computers and uh, give up. I, I just want to note a couple other things because you made reference to my having served in government. And I think there are a couple of things in addition to those things that Martin framed at the top. One is that given the number of crises that are happening, the world's decision makers, whether institutional individual governments are not thinking five, 10 years ahead. They are in the mode of managing every next thing that blows up in front of them. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, the discussion about the kinds of transformation and changes that we're talking about here today <clears throat> are had pretty exclusively in the development climate economist universe. And that's good. That's where there's a lot of the expertise and to get the world to act, you need those actors on board. It isn't really translating into the foreign policy national security debates about the state of the world. Um, except in the most generic sense. If we don't do something, there will be riots and demonstrations. And so I think a, a discussion is pursue, is is unfolding slowly, too slowly, in one side of the world's discussion that is more inclined to agree and be aware of the issues. It's not unfolding in the other side. And I think that's something we've got to think about how we translate and change it. Um, and the third thing is, I don't think that most governments feel a lot of demand on these issues. Um, part of it is, as other speakers have pointed out, most governments right now are focused on what their citizens want. And with inflation and all these multiple crises, there are needs at home. Um, second, the, the voice of those who think that the world is actually economically and otherwise integrated and connected. And that as a matter of practicality and principle, there should be more international global engagement by all of us are much quieter than those that say, ah, screw the rest of the world to be perfectly frank. And I think we've got one of those classic cases where I believe there's a silent majority, but it's easier for people to be against something than for something. And what that means for policymakers is that with some exceptions, 
I think we've seen this on things like HIV AIDS with recent efforts over the last few months to mobilize more resources there. It's changing a bit in climate, but there is insufficient evidence to politicians, many of whom are politicians because they're elected and have voters, that this is something that's a high priority on the part of the voters. So those are just to lengthen the list of problems we have to solve. So I think what we need to do in the next year is, is find a way to capture the imagination of other decision makers and the public on the kinds of issues we're talking about. We can do that partly through sharing some of the facts that have been shared here that are mind blowing in terms of the inequities and what that means and the obvious dysfunction that will yield. So we've got to figure out how to reframe the argument, I think, as number one. Number two, we've heard about the Bridgetown Initiative. I think one of the things that's important there that I just want to emphasize that was made is, you know, look, I've been one, I've got my own vision for where the world should be in five, 10, 20 years, and it's perfect. Um, that's not always the best tactic in trying to get there. And I think the point about we don't have 10 years uh, to do this, we've got to come up with tangibles in the next 18 months. I think several of them were referred to uh, in those five. And I think those are really key, those that fall into the Bridgetown uh, initiative. I think the, the element of that, which we're quite focused on, is what came out of the G20's independent panel report about reforming the world's multilateral development banks. I would use the term modernization. Martin rightly pointed out these institutions, think about it, the, the big ones were built to rebuild Europe so that it could be a powerful economic powerhouse. That is not the role that they are playing today with respect to those parts of the world that have the potential to be economic powerhouses but aren't yet there. And it seems only logical that we should modernize these institutions every 60 or 70 years, kind of seems like an obvious point. The recommendations that were made by this expert panel are wonky but pretty straightforward. The banks, as has been pointed out, they don't take risk. And so the importance of maintaining a AAA credit rating is more important than the risk of inaction. And you know, that's one, this notion of callable capital, that there is capital available that isn't being drawn upon from the major shareholders. More transparency and data, we don't know a lot of what is out there. So there are they're reforms that in the aggregate could yield big change. They're not necessarily simple, but they're doable. But I think the, the piece that is absolutely critical here is that unless and until members of the G20, the major shareholders of the multilateral development banks believe and understand two or three things, we're not gonna see the change. One, what are the practical implications of inaction? Um, very practical in economic terms, in political terms, in security terms. Um, I think number two, what are the cost savings in this? And again, politicians who are elected for four, five, six year terms aren't necessarily focused on the savings over 10 or 20 years, but there is good data to show that investing now in the resilience needed across the spectrum of all of these transnational threats is a cost-effective action to take. Uh, so I think that's something that's got to be understood. And I think the last uh, point that really needs emphasizing here is they need to hear and understand from those countries that are least able to enjoy, act upon the kind of resilience that even though there are difficulties here, the US and Europe can count on and figure out how those reforms need to work for them. Because the other piece of this, in terms of the modernization of these organizations, um, they aren't built to respond to the ways that a finance minister has to respond in a low income country. They're built to respond to the requirements of a shareholder for moving money. So I think we need to do all those things, but understand this is a policy matter but this is also a political matter. Mm. And I think 
I don't think there's a lot of pressure being felt, to be perfectly honest. I'd like to see there be more, but I don't think either the pressure or the permission and the alternative are enough in evidence. So let me just say the, the last point there on permission to do big things on the global stage right now for most leaders of wealthy countries is not your most popular political move. So how do you give them the space, the political space and permission to do it and mobilize people to show if they do the right thing, they'll get support for it. Shouldn't Dale. take long, should be pretty easy. Thank you so much. Um, I, I've got a couple of things that I want to pick up on right, right away. And then perhaps we could go briefly to Haley and David McNair um, to pick up on remarks that they've made in the chat. But one specific and one general question, uh, Gail, the specific one is what would it or will it take for those reforms of MDBs to be enacted? What has to happen next? Well, uh, the shareholders have to agree. Basically, you've got to get enough of the shareholding uh, constituency in the MDBs to agree to the reforms, but they've also then got to uh, require or articulate a, a sufficiently fast track to make sure they're meaningful. And the track it's on now is a fairly familiar track. It's not necessarily bad, but it's pretty slow is there's a sort of tasking that the MDBs really need to think all these proposed reforms through and come back to them with what it would mean. And I think, so it takes decisions by shareholders, some of which have to rely upon their legislatures to, to support things. And it takes a implementation plan uh, that isn't one that takes five or 10 years. Uh, and what is the time scale for that to happen if it if it does happen? Because this is something you and Avinash both em emphasize the need for, uh, among other things, greater risk taking on the part of these banks. Um, are, we, are we talking one year, two years, five years to to get some reform? I think there's got there's got to be, in, and I think in our view, um, an earnest and aggressive start of a reform effort. It's got to start within the next year. Right. It can't, we can't kick it down the road. Um, and, you know, you never want to do these things too fast because you can break things and make huge mistakes. That said, we also don't have to be as slow as international institutions tend to be. So I think an accelerated implementation plan. But we've got a long way to go there because while there is interest uh, on the part of some of the major shareholders, we are not anywhere near the kinds of formal decision and urgency that I think is needed to get it moving in the next year. So that's right. one of the things we're focused on. Thanks. Um, Avinash, I see you have a hand raised, but um, the general question that I wanted to pick up on, uh, Gail, is you mentioned that you don't see political leaders facing much pressure from voters on these questions of institutional reform. And I, I can see when you yeah. couch it, when you couch it like that, that is kind of understandable. But I just want to say two words, war and pandemic. Yeah. Voters aren't stupid. They know that these were these are global crises to which there have to be global solutions. Um, is there not an opportunity for the far sighted uh, politician to make the case to, to foreground, if you'll forgive the, the jargon, um, these issues? because of those two um, compelling facts of our recent history? I think absolutely. And there are some politicians who are making that case very well, as well as the case that you know, it makes good sense to invest now in the resilience we're going to continue to need um, in the cost savings. So I think there are some politicians making those cases. Um, I think they, you know, when I say give politicians permission, Part of it is how do you give them more backing? One of the things that I think the One Campaign has seen continuously and heard from political decision makers is that they get a lot of advocacy, a lot of you must do this demands. They get a lot less sort of thank you and credit when they do the right thing. And it's a small thing, but giving politicians the credit and visibility when they make the right decisions, mm -hmm. that translates. So 
you're absolutely right that yes, there are good arguments to be made. Um, politicians, and look, I'm not defending uh, weak, wrong positions or a lack of what I would like to see, which is more political courage. But I do think breaking through the noise right now, um, making these kinds of cases, you need to be able to say that there's a public out there that wants this to happen. And that's where I think we've got to do more work. Our finding is the public is actually interested. Right. Well, this is why I wanted to come very briefly to Haley. Then we are going to come to Martin and Avinash. Both got your hands up. Haley, you say you agree there is a silent majority. I'd like to agree there's a silent majority. I, the optimist in me hopes hopes that there is, um, but I think the question is, how do you give voice to that? And I, you know, I completely agreed with everything that that Gail was saying. Is that unfortunately, I think there is a very vocal minority, and it does seem that they so often are given profile on the media. They are listened to so much by by politicians, and um, it feels that the there isn't the, you know, it's. It's easier to give profile to the the negative voices who can prevent present a very simplistic solution that is not addressing the kind of the true complexity of the kind of this global interconnected world and the the crisis that we need to deal with. So I think like how do you foster that that public debate? Um, another another uh, challenge is you know and I think this has come up through some of the speakers is you know the the nature of our democratic systems and the short term nature of it. So how do you foster that public debate when? Right now, you know, coming sitting in the UK, the, you know, there are individuals. I think politicians assume, but I think it's probably true for many individuals that people, um, you know, vote winners are things that are going to put money back into people's pockets right now, and it's hard to um, convince politicians that they're going to win votes with things that will will bear fruit in the very very long term. You know, they just want something where they can say yes. You know, we you can they can prove that they're improving people's lives in the short term. So how do you foster that sense of long term thinking, both for individuals as voters um, and for politicians? Really tricky one. It's not just development bankers who are risk averse. It's politicians too. Yes, uh, Avinash and then Martin. I think there's a there's a real moment here today. I think that moment has caused been caused by war, by the pandemic, uh, which really shook uh, the way we think about so many things, um, including what's essential in life, uh, and and the tragedy in Pakistan, the, the scorching summer in Europe and the US, and the floods in Europe and US, uh, have all created a moment. And there is an interplay required between what we call the internal game, the sort of uh, politicians, uh, officials, experts who advise them, and the external game, which is the pressure the politicians get uh, from the public. And the internal game is more progressed than I think some people realize. Uh, the, the, the major shareholders of the MDBs are prepared to uh, push uh, what is uh, what has uh, been uh, suggested by the G20 Working Party? We may not get all of it, but we may well get half of it. So, in fact, our target is the spring meetings of next year, where we expect to get half of the movement. Uh, it needs to be led by the shareholders. But you hear the the UK, France, China, India, uh, even the US pushing quite hard on this reform agenda for the MDBs. And if we can triple the amount of lending. Let's say we, we double it, we don't triple it, but that will make a significant difference. The natural disaster clauses and all the bonds, again, there's a tremendous amount of internal support for that. And we expect a G7, a major borrower, maybe G7, G20, to announce that they're going to put it in all of their bonds to help normalize it by around June. And the idea of a, a 500 billion SDR plan to galvanize um, uh, investor interest in in mitigation in developing countries. Uh, that is something where there's least internal and external support. But the most important thing we need to do, um, the Macron Motley summit in, in June in Paris next year is designed to try and galvanize that internal and external support. So we need all the help we can uh, to do so. It's a big, bold plan to get mitigation being uh, much uh, cheaper to be financed in developing countries. Thank you. Martin. So I just wanted to make two points, which uh, sort of set up where I, how I respond to this very interesting discussion. Um, 
there are two ways of thinking I've come up. I've, I've just finished a book called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, which goes on a lot of the questions in, in the chat, and it will be out in February, and we can. Have, I'd love to have a debate on it. But anyway, the main point, a big point I've made here, there are two ways people think about this. The first, which we've heard of quite a bit of in different ways, is this is a really fundamentally evil and terrible world driven by growthism and um, ghastly multinational corporations. And if we can end all that, we are going to have a perfect world and the problems will go away. Um, and this is a natural way for human beings to think. And I think, from my point of view, completely and totally useless, except that the political pressure of people like that, mobilizing broader majorities, if they're able to do so, can help get us to the second way of thinking about it, which is this is an incredibly urgent problem. Gail, I think, brought this out very well. Um, and, or the number of them are very urgent problems and we need fixes that work now and fixes that work now will not come out of a revolutionary process that will it's going to last two generations at least um and that's essentially what fdr's new deal was about so i refer a lot to the new deal and the thing i like about avinash's approach and some of francis is though not all is that what he's trying to identify and there are other work is one of the things we can do relatively quickly and relatively easily, which will make a big difference. They're not going to solve the problems of the world, but maybe they can keep us going for a little while longer while we try to fix the problems of the world. And the I don't agree with all his proposals, but that would involve a long discussion of where I think these are free lunch free lunches and they're not confronting the real re resource problems involved. But that doesn't matter. It's the right approach. We need targeted, clear reforms around which politicians and politics can mobilize across the borders if we're going to deal with urgent problems. And to do that, you need political pressure. And that's where the wider public debate, discussion and pressure come, comes in. And that's very much how I see the only way out from where we are now. Uh, thanks, Martin. And do come back to talk about the book. Um, Francis, you've got your hand up, and I am not given up. I, I'm going to come back to all four of you one more time <laughs> for your silver bullets. But Francis, I was just um, mulling over this kind of um, idea that there are um, somehow things that we can cooperate on now to do, and I'm wondering where the cooperation is coming from. Uh, and I also wanted to point out something that I've seen a lot of recently, and well, I say recently, but over the last decade really, which is a growing sense of um, everything's awful. And what we really need to do is restore what we had back in the 1950s, or sometimes even longer ago than that. And it seems to me that, that while we've got this kind of let's look backwards and try and restore what we had in the past attitude, it's going to be very difficult to make the kind of changes that I certainly think are going to be necessary going forward, which is at, which actually look forward and look at what we're trying to achieve rather than where we were in the past. There's a tendency to look backwards and see everything through rose tinted glasses. Um, and I do see a lot of that going on, okay. and a great deal of fear of things that are different and don't take us back to something we had before. Okay, well, Francis, I'm gonna put you on the spot right now, bearing in mind, the, the crises that we've discussed, the potential, the, the solutions, both general and specific, is there a one um, reform to the way that the world's supranational bodies are run, or is there a whole new body that you would like to introduce that would you regard as the single most effective um, uh, solution to uh, these crises that have, um, so far defeated uh, everything that humanity has thrown at them? And I'm going to answer you and say no, because there is no simple solution. And I think if we can get away from this idea that there's some kind of silver bullet, some kind of, if we can just turn, abolish the IMF and the world back and replace them with something else, um, right. Or whatever, then all our problems will be solved. And I don't think so, because I look at our at, at the people in our democratic processes, which is actually what underpins these. And we might mm -hmm. say it shouldn't be nation states, but nation states is what we've got and it's what people like and it's what people vote for. Um, it's not, it wouldn't change anything. We've got to work with what we have. And what we have is a lot of people who 
for one reason or another, at the moment, the world is turning towards nationalism and we have to work with that. Um, and there, I mean, there are good reasons for that. Um, and I just, I, but I'm very, very wary of simple solutions. It says, let's just replace the IMF with, and the World Bank with an all singing, all dancing world central bank and development bank that can issue all the money we need to solve climate change and finance it all with people's QE. And I'm going, you're never going to get political agreement for that. Fair um, enough. It's and I, anyway, I admire your determination resisting my goading. Um, uh, Avinash, I, I think it was you who, who pointed out that the twin problems threatening to paralyze the UN. Could we not do something specific there? We can do many specific things. We can reform the MDBs and we can start with a spring meeting, in which case we can double and triple the amount that they lend from $80 billion to $240 billion. It won't throw everything in the world, but it will make a significant difference. We can reform the way we have the eligibility for concessional lending. It won't solve all the world problems. It will make a huge difference in accelerating investment in adaptation in the climate vulnerable countries. We can put natural disaster clauses in all bond instruments. It won't solve everything. It will make a huge difference. Access to $1 trillion of liquidity for developing countries in a crisis and with, with no altering of the, of the power between debtors and creditors. Uh, so that is an achievable thing. Those three things we can achieve within the next 12 months. It requires pressure from people like the One Campaign and others to support this movement, perhaps with an ambition of getting to something bigger and better, uh, but this is something, a journey along the way. And the final thing I'd say is we do need a big, bold plan to have a, a third balance sheet that sits outside countries, because otherwise developing countries will be sunk under a notion of debt, which finances climate mitigation and SDGs. Uh, we believe there's 500 billion of unused SDRs. They need to be employed to do that, uh, but they will take some time to do that. But I think that is something we can focus on, is practical, is achievable, and can be done, and right. will make a big difference. Thank you. Um, uh, Michael Stewart, has, Sitchler has said, it's too easy to use, quote, it's very complex as an excuse to not do stuff. Martin, I know you have to go. Um, if you had to alight upon one single policy proposal that you think had a chance of being uh, of getting traction uh, for the reform of any world body, what would it be? Well, I'm going to um, just to give some more strength. It's, we're we're focused. I think the biggest international issues are um, contrary to somebody in the, in the chat uh, are climate and development, and the second is peace. Uh, uh, and we've had pretty good reason to see why uh, peace is rather important recently. Um, unfortunately, I can't think of any international institutional changes which will ensure that the US and China play nicely together. Uh, I wish I could, but I don't. But on the economic side, uh, it seems to me there are a number of technical changes. I've been a very strong supporter of using SDRs in different ways. I like the, the idea of risk sharing bonds. I used to support GDP um, linked bonds. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to go with climate linked bonds. The existing structure of finance, technical structure of finance can be used, changed very uh, relatively, relatively easily. I agree that the MDBs are underutilized. Uh, I don't believe they can be expanded as much as Avinash thinks, but they can certainly be expanded uh, uh, substantially. And I think if we had enough political pressure on governments to do to feel that they have to do something, they might do these sorts of things and they might make quite a significant difference, particularly to what's going on in emerging and developing countries. And I think these are the right sorts of approaches to these problems. I can list more, but I think that's the right, the best way of thinking. The combination of very strong political pressure for change with practical proposals that you could actually make work relatively quickly is, I think, the right way of thinking about what we need to do. Thanks so much. Gail, last word uh, for you. As Martin said, uh, political pressure on governments is critical. Other people have said that too. Uh, I'm just going to slightly switch the goalpost here, having asked you for a policy silver bullet. How do you intensify that essential political pressure on governments, giving them permission in, to use your formulation, uh, which is the way we try to get stuff done in democracies? 
Yeah, I, I'd say a couple things. And I think Martin and, and Avinash have made clear that there are a number of very tangible steps that can be taken. And the advantage of doing that is that once you get one step, two step, three step that start to be successful and yield returns, you build the confidence in doing them. Now, I among those would focus among that part of the uh, reforms proposed to the G20 that is about managing risk, because that's where I think the political mind shift needs to happen in terms of how we see risk, whether it's what's right in front of us or what's coming because of the structural problems we've talked about. Um, Look, I think the way to do this is, is, again, frame it in terms that capture people's imagination. I think people believe in fairness, but also speak to their self-interest because people are concerned about what's going on themselves. And I think, remember that, Francis, what you said about this, let's go back to the 1950s when things were a lot less complicated, drives me totally crazy, happens here all the time. And is a very common, uh, I think, political trend we're seeing in a lot of places. What we've also got, though, is another political trend, is a rising generation of people in their 20s and 30s that are not thinking about the last 40 years, but are thinking about the next 50 years. And I think the more we root our arguments uh, in the voices, the power at, at local political levels across the board, of people whose frame is the next 50 and not the last 40. Um, there's more of them than there are, well, I'm not talking about the last 40, but I'm of an age where I could, mm -hmm. than there are of us. So I think that's the other thing we've got to do. And then last point I would make to people, because look, I look at these issues and sometimes I get so angry and outraged that I fall into the, it's everything or nothing. It's absolute. I think what we've got to understand is that building change block by block can ultimately be just as transformational and revolutionary as going for everything at once. So spring meetings, Amnash is right. We've got, we've got stations to stop at on this train and we've got to just go for specific changes in each one of them, build up a bigger piece and and organize. We've just got to organize ourselves. Thank you so much. Uh, we've run a little over time. Um, Gail, Francis, Avinash, and Martin, who I think is facing that perennial occupational hazard of newspaper life, the deadline, or I imagine. Um, uh, it's been a great conversation. I recognize that a lot of people have been very busy in the chat. Nico, I see you there. I'm sorry that we haven't had time to get to everybody. But uh, there's been some specific agreement on the need for greater risk appetite on the part of multilateral development banks. There's been a lot of love for the Bridgetown Initiative, even though Martin couldn't get behind all five components. Um, I think there's tremendous uh, admiration for the specificity of it, for the ambition of it, for the essential optimism of it. Um, so thank you. Once again, uh, we will all look forward to those to those spring meetings and we'll take on board Gail's final uh, invocation that uh, block by block works, even if uh, we cannot realize a perfect world all at once. It's, oh my goodness, 2.39. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a very good rest of your day and week. <laughs>